Yigwich August Falcher Row of Galair, Higon Lakes, Bashilta Shaw, Kun Kamora, a yen of Evra, Neve Colum Killa, Dinner the Fathrun Naheran. Welcome back after the summer holidays and to all those who are joining us for the first time. You're all very welcome to this spe special lecture to commemorate and celebrate the 15th centenary of the birth of St. Colum Killa, St. Columba of Iona one of the patron saints of Ireland. My name is Alexander O'Hara, and I'm the organizer of this series of lectures hosted by the Loyola Institute in partnership with Trinity College Library and Trinity Long Room Hub. The aim of this series is to combine scholarship and engagement from the fields of theology and medieval history in presenting Columcilla in context. This evening's lecture, which is a third in our series, will last about 40 minutes and there will be time for discussion and Q&A afterwards. St. Columba's life and memory as recorded and perpetuated by his monastic communities consciously placed him in the tradition of a number of prominent late antique saints. This lecture will consider the saints his community drew upon to craft St. Columba's image with a particular focus on the enduring interest his community showed in the Egyptian Desert Fathers, St. Anthony of Egypt and St. Paul of Thebes. The lecture will look at how these monastic pioneers formed a crucial component of the Columban monastic community's cultural memory by examining key pieces of literature and art produced by his community from the 7th to the 11th centuries. It's my pleasure to introduce Meredith Coutrere, who will deliver this evening, evening's lecture. Meredith is the Michael Biggs Scholar and a DPhil candidate in history at Worcester College, Oxford University. She is a historian of the late antique and the early medieval periods, specializing in exile, penance, historical theology, and early Irish law. Her doctoral uh, work focuses on the church's use of exile and banishment in early medieval Ireland and Britain. Additionally, she is currently co-authoring a translation and commentary on the O'Donoghue Lives, a collection of uh, Hiberno-Latin saints' lives. And she regularly participates in archeological digs, including excavations at Tintagel, Bindolanda, Glendalock, Kazaki Yatkan in Uzbekistan, and Cap de Caviera in Menorca. So, Meredith, you're very welcome. All right, thank you. Let me just get my screen up here. All right, can you all see my screen? Okay. All right, so thanks so much, Alex. It's really an honor for me to have this opportunity to talk this evening about two subjects that have actually attracted my attention for a really long time now, over a decade, actually. Um, the first being uh, the Egyptian influence in Ireland, and the second being the intersection of theology and exile. Now, before I get started, I'm sensitive to the fact that those tuning in this evening come from a range of familiarity regarding medieval Ireland and late antique Egypt. So I'm going to provide some introductory remarks to each new figure and each new work that I will be discussing just in order to acquaint those who may have no familiarity at all with what I'm discussing uh, with the essential details that they will need to follow what I'm talking about. So the topic of Columba and the Fathers, as anyone who has studied Columba will know, is a really ambitious topic for a talk because the monks and his communities uh, are known to have drawn from an impressive number of sources in their writings about their founder. But the, this evening, instead of going broad and looking at all of the different influences, I actually want to go deep uh, and examine a particular set of fathers. Specifically, I'm really fascinated and have been for a long time in the Egyptian desert fathers of late antiquity. Two of the most prominent that are actually featured here on this slide, uh, which are Antony of Egypt on the left, and on the right, we have uh, St. Paul of Thebes. We can see the influence of these Egyptian saints on Columbus monastic communities from the Columban community's earliest literature 
through to the high crosses that are erected in several Columban monasteries centuries later. So this evening, I'm going to focus on the tower cross at Kells. I will reconstruct to the best of my ability some of the circumstances in which it was made to see why perhaps the Columban communities attach such importance to Paul and Antony and how these two Egyptian desert fathers were understood and used by Columbus communities. So to accomplish this, we're going to look briefly at excerpts from two key pieces of literature about Columba. Specifically, we're gonna look at Columba's death scene in the life of Columba by Adavnan and a portion of the homiletic opening by the anonymous Middle Irish Betha Colum Gill. So we're going to spend most of our time though actually considering the Paul and Antony panel on the Tower Cross at Kells, alongside similar panels in other monasteries, just for the sake of comparison. What we're going to see, I hope, is that the Egyptian desert fathers, especially Antony and Paul, were crucial figures in the formation of the Columban community's identity. We will also see that some of the most important pieces of Irish art and Irish literature use the Desert Fathers, um, and they did so in order to remind the community that they are members of a spiritual family with a spiritual ancestry that's rooted in the deserts of Egypt. In other words, the lives of Antony and Paul served in part of a foundation story for the Columban communities to explain who the communities were, where they came from, and where they hoped to go. As we will see this evening in many instances, that when the Columba community drew upon the Desert Fathers, it was in a conscious effort both to show themselves as part of the same ascetic family, and crucially, uh, the monks, uh, the Columba monks would draw upon the images and the lives of Paul and Antony, in part, to promote a contemporary vision of peace and unity. First, the focus of tonight's talk is concerning the celebration of the sixth century Irish Saint Columba, or Colum Kill as he's known in Irish, who is one of Ireland's most important saints, as Alex explained. Columba is celebrated as a monastic founder, as a, as a missionary to present day Scotland, and he was also remembered as a poet and as a scribe. Now Columba is the subject of several biographies, two of which we will consider briefly this evening and which are found in the medieval manuscripts that are pictured on this slide. So the first manuscript on the left is the Latin life of Columba, sometimes known among scholars as the Vita Columbae. It's written by the ninth abbot of Iona. His name is Adavnan. We will be talking a lot about Adavnan tonight. And it was written approximately a century after Columba's death. Adavnan's work is the most important work we have for the memorialization of Columba and its impact lasted for centuries after it was written. The other biography we'll be look, we will look at is the Middle Irish life called the Betha Colum Kill, which was likely written sometime in the 11th or 12th century, though that date is tentative. That, and we can find that manuscript over on the right where the arrow is pointing. Now, Columba's exact birth year is unknown. It's sometime between 520 and 522, a slightly later tradition uh, gives it at 521, so that seems like a reasonable compromise. Now, he came from a very powerful and a very well-connected Irish family in the north of Ireland. He was well-educated, and according to his saints' lives, he showed an eagerness for a life of holiness at a very early age, in typical Irish fashion. Now, one of Columba's main claims to fame, and the reason why Columba is near and dear to my heart, comes from his status as an exile. So sometime around the year 563, at the age of 42, Columba wished to be a pilgrim for Christ. And so he left Ireland for Britain, where he founded the influential monastery of Iona in the Inner Hebrides, which is found in present day Scotland. He was to spend the rest of his life as a holy exile for God. In leaving Ireland for his lifelong religious exile, he joined the ranks of some of Ireland's most illustrious saints, we have St. Columbanus, St. Fursi, St. Brendan, who's not pictured here, and uh, St. Columba, just to name four. Uh, these people are usually called by their Latin name, the Peregrini, which means pilgrim, foreigner, or exile in Latin. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done in understanding the reasons that these Irish religious exiles left their homeland from a theological perspective. But it is illuminating for us to consider how their communities remembered their founders' exile for possible clues. 
The Middle Irish life of Columba is particularly interesting in this regard because it offers this really fulsome, beautiful homiletic introduction to Columba's life. The author in the introduction places Columba in the tradition of three fathers. And these are the three fathers we're going to discuss tonight. The first is the biblical patriarch Abraham, whom Christians consider to be their spiritual father, as well as the saints Antony and St. Paul, both Egyptian desert fathers. Now, the author makes clear that Saints Antony and St. Paul are following in the tradition of Abraham, who is the original exile for God. So these three are considered the exiles for God par excellence in the tradition that Columba will be following. Now, in this excerpt on this slide, the Irish author of the Betha Colum Kill says, Now in three ways are men summoned to the knowledge of the Lord and to the membership of his family. This is the first way, the urging and kindling of men by the divine grace to serve the Lord after the example of Paul and of Anthony, the monk, and of the other faithful monks who used to serve God there in Egypt. So following in Abraham's footsteps, the author tells us that Paul and Anthony and the other Egyptian desert fathers, who uh, include Paul and Anthony, of course, join that same spiritual family as Abraham. Abraham, Paul, and Anthony are held up by the Columban family to be the best examples of how to become a part of God's family. And our Columban author makes clear in his introduction that Columba, their founder, is following in the footsteps of these three fathers of the faith. So I want to consider the stories of the great Egyptian saints, Antony and Paul, who are, might be unfamiliar to many of you all in the audience tonight, because these, uh, these figures show up regularly in literature and art from that period. So first we'll start with Antony. He's the most famous of them and he is the one we see most frequently in Irish art. So Antony was considered to be the father of monasticism and his call to the ascetic life is one of the most well-known. It's up there with St. Augustine's call to uh, the Christian life in the Confessio. And it's one of the most well-known from late antiquity thanks to the talents of his biographer who was the Bishop of Alexandria named Athanasius. Athanasius wrote a biography or a piece of hagiography about Antony that really became uh, what was considered a late antique bestseller. Now Athanasius recounts for us the life of a humble, illiterate Egyptian youth whose life in the desert was marked by brutal, nearly fatal fights with demons as pictured here, but also had times of ecstatic, euphoric, intimate encounters with God. When Antony was around 18 to 20 years old, he sold his possessions and he retreated into the Egyptian desert, where he was to live the rest of his life mostly in solitude, prayer, and fasting in preparation for heaven. His life is, was in, uh, inspired countless Christians for over a millennia to seek God through the monastic life. Antony's life was also used to promote unity in a time of serious division in the Egyptian church. We'll return to that motif in just a moment. But for now, I want to turn our attention to the second Egyptian desert father who appears regularly in Irish art and literature. St. Paul of Thebes, or St. Paul the Hermit as he is sometimes called, was also born in Egypt around the year 227. He lived at the same time as Antony, but he was a few decades older. Paul lived during the time of the Emperor Decius' persecution of Christians that occurred in the year 250. And it was during the year 250, when Decius was ramping up persecution against Christians, that Paul of Thebes fled into the desert to escape persecution. Unlike most Christians who went back to the cities and the villages once the persecution was over, uh, Paul decided he liked the desert and decided that he would never return, that he was going to stay in the desert. Paul, in fact, retreated further and further into the desert until at last he came to a rocky mountain with a cave which had been used as a mint in the days of Antony and Cleopatra's affair. Paul was to spend the rest of his life in this isolated cave in prayer and solitude. Now this map here shows the location of Antony and Paul's caves, and there you can see they're relatively close together. They are both located in the eastern desert of Egypt near the Red Sea. Now their close proximity allowed for a meeting between these two great saints. 
And this meeting between the two great saints is one of the um, foundational legends of, um, of, the, of the legends surrounding these two figures. And it's one that we're going to see repeated in Irish art uh, frequently. So about this meeting, at the age of 113, 113 years old, Paul was still living in the same cave when the 90-year-old Antony, after being told in a dream that Paul was a far more perfect monk than he was, decided that he was going to pay Paul a visit. So he undertook a harrowing journey through the desert where he braved a range of mythological creatures, including centaurs. But at long last, our hero made it to Paul's cave. However, Paul was not particularly excited to see him and actually gave him quite a chilly reception initially. But Antony was not persuaded or dissuaded to leave. So he, uh, he, he stayed and Paul was actually quite touched by Antony's persistence. So Paul let Antony in, the two monks embraced and as they talked, a raven flew down from heaven with an entire loaf of bread in his mouth. And he placed this bread in front of the two monks. Now, Paul remarked, that for the last 60 years, this raven brought him half a loaf of bread daily. But today, God had provided double his daily ration to accommodate Antony. Now, a dispute broke out between Antony and Paul about who would have the honor of breaking the loaf in two, because each one wanted to give honor to the other. Antony wanted to give honor to Paul for being the older monk, and Paul wanted to give honor to Antony for being a guest. And the two could not decide who was going to break the bread for them to eat. Finally, after a long discussion, they decided that they would each hold part of the bread and pull at the same time. And they enjoyed their meal in Christian unity and peace. Now, the story of Antony and Paul became quite popular in art as some of the artistic representations I've shown here. Um, and it invites several interpretive possibilities, all of which Irish art historians have noted and explicated in brilliant detail. One of them on the most basic level, this story provided a testimony of God giving miraculous provision to his people. Now in the medieval Irish context, it has been shown to have a Eucharistic meaning attached to it. And this is something that Eamon O'Carrigan has uh, brilliantly expounded upon in a, in a number of pieces. It has also been interpreted as a model of Christian harmony after a conflict and an important story that promotes Christian unity and concord. And that's the one I wanna focus on tonight because that's the one that has been least explored in uh, terms of this panel. So the stories of Antony and Paul in Ireland as elsewhere provided Irish monks with an origin story or a foundation myth for their way of life. The 8th century Irish canon law collection, the Hibernensis, for instance, in a section entitled Concerning the Beginning and Authority of Monks, called Paul and Antony the beginning and the uh, called Paul and Antony fathers, exemplars, and most noble progenitors of the monastic way of life. Paul and Antony were an important part of medieval Irish monastic identity, especially within the Columban communities. The importance of Paul and Antony and in particular, this raven scene, uh, to medieval Irish monastic communities, and especially in Columbus communities, is made obvious in the art of the high crosses. In seeing Paul and Antony as the origin for their way of life, the medieval Irish monks were actually following in the footsteps of several well-known patristic authors that were well-known in Ireland as well. So Jerome, who was the author of The Life of Paul, wrote in his letter to Eustochium that Paul was the originator of this way of life, talking about monasticism. Antony made it famous. And then Cashin, an author quite influential in medieval Ireland, wrote, the originators of monasticism were those whom we mentioned just now, Saints Paul and Antony. So one of the greatest contributions of medieval Ireland is undoubtedly its magnificent stone crosses a number of which are carved with scenes derived primarily and actually indeed overwhelmingly from the Bible as the two panels I provided here show. These are typical biblically inspired scenes that we find regularly on the medieval Irish high crosses, including the high crosses we're gonna take a close look at tonight. 
However, the high crosses offer us a bit of a surprise. In the midst of the overwhelmingly biblically derived panels, we find numerous panels featuring scenes derived from the Egyptian desert fathers, Paul and Antony. We see the first instance of such a panel in insular art on the Ruthwell cross. So this arrow points to the location of the famous Ruthwell cross, which is a cousin to Ireland's famous high crosses. This cross is important because it acts as a type of Rosetta Stone, if you will, helping us to clarify what might otherwise be a very challenging scene to interpret if we didn't have the Ruthwell cross explaining to us what we're seeing. So on the Ruthwell cross, we see the first instance of the Paul and Antony breaking bread motif in insular art. While it does not feature a raven like its Irish counterparts do, what we see is Paul and Antony standing, facing each other, pulling the bread apart simultaneously. Now this scene might have gone unidentified, except that quite mercifully, there is an inscription surrounding the panel, which I've provided a transcription and translation of on the slide. It's corrupted in a few places, but we can still make out more or less what it's saying. It says St. Paul and Antony broke bread in the desert. Now the language on the cross of breaking bread, which is derived directly from Jerome's life of Paul, is one reason the Irish attached a Eucharistic meaning to the scene. Because when we see such language in the Bible, it's almost always in the context of communion. Now the story of a, the raven flying down from heaven with bread would also recall to a medieval Irish monk, a line that we see in the early Irish, ma uh, early Irish mass book called the Stowe Missal. As part of its Eucharistic liturgy, the priest is instructed to say, this is the living bread which descends from heaven. The connection between the miraculous bread from the raven on the one hand and Jesus, the bread of life who came down from heaven on the other hand, is not a difficult uh, connection to make. Now, turning to the high crosses in Ireland, we see the Egyptian desert fathers regularly in Irish sculpture. Two scenes in particular seem to especially resonate with the monastic communities. The first is the temptation of Antony scene, which I've given three examples of on this slide. And the second is the Paul and Antony uh, being fed by a raven scene, which is the one that we're actually going to consider tonight. I'm going to have to leave the temptation of Antony for another, another day uh, due to time constraints. So we will focus on the Paul and Antony scene on one of Ireland's most famous high crosses, the Tower Cross at the Columban Foundation of Kells, which is pictured here. Sometimes this cross is also called the Cross of Patrick and Columba. Now, the Tower Cross at Kells offers us a unique chance to consider the function of the Paul and Antony panel in a monastic setting. As our historians will affirm, dating Ireland's scripture crosses is notoriously challenging as there are often few clues to contextualize their construction. However, the Tower Cross is quite unique. An inscription on the base of the Tower Cross allows for approximate dating, thus giving us a chance to give a plausible reconstruction of at least some of its historical context. We will discuss this inscription in just a moment. On the Irish high crosses, including the Tower Cross at Kells here, as you can see by the labels I've provided uh, that, I, uh, that I've given here, nearly all the panels are derived from the Bible. It is significant that here on this cross, and as we see on nearly all the high crosses from this period, that the only two non-biblical figures we regularly see are the Egyptian desert fathers, Paul and Antony. There are possibly 20 scenes in Ireland, between two and five scenes in Pictlin, and one on the Ruthwell cross, which is on the border of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, which feature one or both saints. Now, Eamon O'Carrigan has pointed out in his book, Ritual and the Rude, though Jerome's life of Paul was well known throughout Europe, it is only in Ireland and in Pickland, which are areas influenced by Columban monasticism, that the meeting between Paul and Antony was frequently seen in stone sculpture at this early date. It's worth considering just how remarkable this fact is when the scenes that they portray, which are scenes uh, typically of being tempted by demons or of receiving bread miraculously in the desert are actually scenes that we have 
uh, that it could easily be represented by well-known stories with well-known figures in the Bible, which would actually keep the high crosses much more consistent uh, for having all of their scenes derived from the Bible if they were to choose to represent those scenes using biblical figures rather than Paul and Antony. But instead of doing that, they instead chose these non-biblical saints time and again. What's even more interesting is that Ireland has by far the largest number of Paul and Antony scenes of anywhere in Europe before the year 1000. So turning our attention to Kells, of the four high crosses found at Kells, one on the left here is unfinished, one on the right here is broken, but the two complete crosses, which are the Margaret Cross and the Tower Cross, both feature Paul and Antony panels. The Margaret Cross actually features two panels with the Desert Fathers. It has an Anthony with the Demons panel and a uh, Paul and Anthony panel. So let's take a look now at the Paul and Anthony scene at Kells. While both panels on the Market and Tower Crosses represent the same scene, and Roger Stalley posits that they are actually um, constructed most likely by the same artist, though uh, probably kind of far apart in his career, we can see there are significant differences in composition. We see, for instance, that on the Market Cross on the left, we find a more symmetrical composition. The two saints have their croziers crossed in a chi pattern, which represents Jesus, and both are standing facing each other as they accept the bread from the raven who is seen in flight coming down between the saints' heads. On the right, we have the same scene, but here the saints are seated, but with their croziers by their sides and not crossed. Now, in looking at their clothes, the artist actually seeks to make the scene a more Irish one than is presented in Jerome's, <laughs> Jerome's description, which uh, presents a very memorable description of Paul's clothes. So in Jerome's life of Paul, uh, Paul is represented as uh, having a, an outfit, a tunic made of palm leaves. And this is typically represented in art as a crosshatch pattern. And we actually have an example in modern day Scotland of one such example of Alice Wester of uh, such uh, an attempt at a crosshatch pattern on uh, Paul's outfit. But our Kells artist does not really show any interest in doing that. Uh, so not only does he ignore Jerome's description of Paul's clothes, he also goes on to include kind of what we would consider distinctively Irish features, so, such as the inclusion of croziers, which are found often in the hands of Irish clerics, uh, as well as what looks to be maybe perhaps like a book satchel at the feet of the uh, Irish saint on the right, which is uh, common for Irish monks, not so much for Egyptian monks. So while representing two Egyptian monks, the panels have an undeniably Irish flavor. Now, as I noted earlier, I want to focus on the Kells Tower Cross because it offers us a chance to consider the Paul and Antony scene with regards to the circumstances which it was made due to its inscription on its base. The inscription on the base reads Patricii et Columbae Crux in Latin, which is translated as the cross of Patrick and Columba. Now the unique aspect of the Tower Cross's inscription is not in the fact that it is dedicated to two saints, Patrick and Columba. The fact that ta the Tower Cross at Kells is dedicated to a saint is not unusual at all, actually. Uh, just uh, for sake of example, the Columban Monastery of Iona, for instance, has four high crosses, each that are dedicated to saints, two of which are pictured here. So we have on the left, the cross of St. Martin on the left, and on the right, we have a replica of St. John's cross. Rather, the unusual aspect of the inscription on the Kells Tower cross comes from the fact that it is dedicated to two prominent saints from historically rival federations. Now, Patrick's Federation, which was based at Armagh, and Columbus Federation, which was based at Iona, had a rivalry to some degree, at least uh, according to the literary sources that we can see at various points coming out in the literature produced in these two monastic federations from the 7th century through to the 11th century. So friction to some degree uh, between these two monastery, between these two monastic federations um, was centuries old by the time of the Tower Cross's construction. 
So important texts, for instance, from the seventh century, uh, including the Liber Angeli, for instance, uh, through to the 11th century, including an entry from the Annals of Ulster for the year 874, which was near to the time of the Tower Cross's construction, show the two federations in some measure of competition for primacy and for property in Ireland. So just to give one example from one text of the kind of tension that we sometimes see in the literature, the relatively late tripartite life of Patrick, which was likely composed sometime between the 10th and the 12th centuries, though dating this text is, is quite tricky, we find two complaints by Patrick's community against the Columban community. In the first complaint that I've given here on this slide, the patrician author claims that a property that was previously held by the patrician community is now through deceit, part of the Columban Federation. It says a place close by it to the south belonged to Patrick. One of his household, Dicol's son, set up there, Colum Kill, and that represents Columbus community. Columbus community hath it now through cunning. The second complaint alleges that, Columban, that the Columban family is encroaching upon patrician properties when he says that Colum Kill has come down upon a particular church. So it's in this context of at least some measure of uh, rivalry between the Patrician Federation and the Columban Federation uh, during a time when Armagh's influence, the Patrician family's influence is on the rise, that a cross dedicated to both Patrick and Columba located in the Columban Monastery is quite interesting. Now our historian Roger Stalley argues quite compellingly and convincingly that the only time in Kell's history when scripture crosses were being produced in the style of the Tower Cross would such a dedication make sense would be the during the tenure of the powerful and capable leader, Melbrichta MacTornan. Certainly the wording describing him as the Comarba, which is the Irish word for heir or successor of Patrick and Columba in his obituary from the Annals of Ulster, which I've underlined in red here, um, bears a resemblance to the Tower Cross's inscription, which I've included just below the analytic entry for the sake of comparison. Now, Bre Mael Bricta is a really unusual figure in Ireland. We know that he was quite powerful and he was a very capable leader. The Annals of Ulster uh, represent him as being a person who not only wielded a lot of power, but who was well known for having a conciliatory role in several negotiations. Now, in the ninth century in Ireland, monasteries, the Patrician uh, Federation, as well as the Columban Familia, typically drew their leaders from set families. Male Bricta came from a family that was actually closely tied to the Columban Familia. But somewhat surprisingly, he was chosen to be the leader of the Patrician Familia in 888. Now, Moira Herbert, I think, compellingly argues that this was uh, in, or in order to make peace in Armagh after a lot of the families that had been uh, supplying the abbots of Armagh uh, were fighting. So this was meant to, they chose an outsider in order to make peace among the, the rival families vying for power there. Now, once he was established in Armagh in 888, it was even more surprising then that just three years later, he was then given the leadership over the Columban Familia. So this made him effectively the leader of both the Columban Familia and the patrician familia simultaneously. Now, whatever the motivation behind Mael Bricta's dual appointments to historically rival federation might be, and again, I think Maura Herbert in her book, Iona uh, Kells and Derry offers the most compelling explanation, his becoming the Columban leader while already entrenched in Armagh's upper echelon during a time when Armagh's influence uh, and power was on the rise would have been, I think, a significant cause of concern for the Columban communities. So it is in this context, we should look to the Tower Cross with an eye to what the cross's commissioner would have utilized the Desert Fathers on the cross uh, for and how the community might have understood the Paul and Anthony panel on the cross. Now here it's helpful to consider uh, and to bring in Adamnan's life of Columba and what clues it may provide to how the community viewed Antony in particular since he is seen most often on the high crosses and indeed is seen three times in the Kells crosses in particular. I think looking uh, carefully at a few aspects of the life of Columba will help us uncover some of the meaning that the monks of the Columban familia associated with the image of Antony and Paul. 
So in Out of Nun's Life of Columba, we find the longest chapter by far is the scene recounting Columba's death. And it is here, I would argue, that Out of Nun's story reaches its climax because Columba's death scene gives Columba's community his final instructions and the message that he most wanted his community to remember. Now it was crucially important uh, in this crucially important chapter, perhaps the most important chapter of the entire saint's life. It is striking that Adam Nun borrows most frequently from one source. The source that he borrows from most regularly is the life of Antony. So in the entire life of Columba, I have counted 12 times that Adam Nun has taken quotes directly from the life of Antony or has made such a strong allusion to the life of Antony that it is clear that the life of Antony was his source. Of those 12 borrowings, 10 of them are found in one chapter recounting Columbus' death. The fact that 10 out of 12 references to the life of Antony occur in one scene is remarkable and worth considering why Adonan has made this choice because of all people he could have chosen to draw from, and indeed Adonan is well known to have drawn from several famous saints for the composition of the life of Columba, including uh, the life of Benedict, and especially the life of Martin of Tours. But we don't really see them too much in the death scene. What we see is Antony. So we want to take a look at why has he chose to draw from Antony? While it would be overstating the case to say that Adonan is modeling Columba's death after Antony's, What's undeniable is that Adavnan is wanting his audience to make strong connection between Antony and Columba during this defining moment in the Columban community's history. A saint's dying words are a powerful tool to speak to contemporary problems and propagate a vision for the future. And this is well explicated in uh, David Brackey's work on Athanasius and the politics of asceticism. So the question is, what is the key message or messages that Columba or Adavnan, writing through the person of Columba, wants his community to know in this scene? Now I'm going to hone in on just one major message. I'm not trying to say that this is the only message that Adavnan is wanting to impart, but there's one I think that's pretty clear that's coming through quite forcefully in his dying words. Now, one of the key purposes for writing down the life of a saint is, of course, to inspire others uh, to imitate the saint's life. The dying words of a saint are crucial for understanding those key lessons that a saint or his biographer wish to impart upon his or her community. So as we look at a few points of Antony's death scene, I'm going to place excerpts from Columba's death scene beneath it to draw some parallels between Antony's death and Columba's death to show that Columbus community wrote about Columbus death in such a way as to bring Antony repeatedly to the mind when Columbus community would read about their own founder's death. This also served to place Columba in the same tradition and in the same spiritual family as Antony, which is a theme we're gonna to return to at the end of tonight. Just before they died, Antony and Columba both said the exact same words to their communities. We have, my dear sons, in the language of the scriptures, I am going the way of the fathers. Now you'll notice Columba does not say my dear sons, Filioli, in this particular spot. He says it elsewhere uh, in, the, in the chapter in his death scene, but not at this one. So there are two points I want to emphasize here. The first is the language of family. Both monastic founders understood their past as following fathers that went before them. They also saw their monks as their spiritual children. As Columba uses the same term filioli, meaning dear sons, it's a, it's a term of endearment in Latin, a little later on. Now using the language of family is a powerful tool used to build a sense of identity. And these monastic communities, both in Ireland and in Egypt, use the language of family to emphasize their close bonds with their fellow monks. But what is important to remember is that this is a family that has nothing to do with blood, but has everything to do with the family that a monk chooses to be in through his faith in Christ. The Columba communities, by viewing Antony as their father, and by having their founder Columba use the same words as Antony in such a crucial moment in his life, shows that Antony is a key part of the Columban family's communities of who, understanding of who they are. Now, Antony's dying words continue. He tells his spiritual sons, avoid too the schismatics and the heretics poisons. And he uses this word, winina. 
you should be concerned to keep the Lord's commandments. Now, Antony's final speech is actually quite lengthy. But one of the key messages in Antony's final words is an unambiguous denunciation of people who wish to divide the body of Christ, which was a very serious threat to the unity of the Egyptian church in Antony and Athanasius' day, which was being ripped apart with schism. Now, in this excerpt, Antony calls divisions of those who disrupt the unity of the church poisons, which the Latin version of Antony's life that the Columban monks would have read translates as quinina. This is the exact same word that Adavnon uses in, most, in one of the most famous scenes in the life of Columba. So on the day that he died, Columba raised his hands and blessed the island of Iona, saying, from this moment, all poisons, and then uh, we have Winina there for poisons, of snakes shall be powerless to harm men or cattle in the lands of this island, so long as the inhabitants shall observe the commandments of Christ. Now, several commentators have noted the, uh, the parallel here with uh, Gregory the Great's dialogues, and I think that's correct. But I want to pick up on an argument that Jennifer O'Reilly actually made uh, that I thought was quite insightful. So this scene of Columba rendering snakes venom harmless is bizarre to a modern audience. But it's such an important story to Adabnan that he actually repeats the story twice in the life of Columba, once in book two, and then once again uh, mentioning it in Columba's death scene. So the significance of this scene to a medieval Irish audience was explained well by the late scholar, one of my favorites, Jennifer O'Reilly, who showed how Adavnan was drawing upon a patristic and late antique motif, which equated division and heresy in the church with the venom of snakes. To cite just one example of several uh, from an insular author, we see in the quote on the slide, the sixth century cleric Gildas, which reads, the pleasant agreement between the head and the limbs of Christ endured until the Aryan treason, like a savage snake vomited its foreign poison, Winina, upon us and caused the fatal separation of brothers who had lived as one. In this, he describes the heresy of Arianism as a savage snake that vomited its foreign poison on Britain, causing division to the Christian community. So in Columba's death scene, when he made the snake's venom harmless, the Irish audience would have understood, as Jennifer O'Reilly, I think, correctly notes, that this is, would be a banishing of heresy and strife from the community so long as they keep God's commands. So Columbus rendering the snakes as harmless is intended to safeguard the peace, the concord, and the unity of his community. In the same way as Antony's warning to avoid the poison of schismatics who divide the faithful, thus destroying the peace of fellowship. So we see this concern for unity in the death scenes of both Antony and Columba. According to Adavdan, the very final words, the very last speech that Columba gave is actually quite short, but it's impactful. He says, I commend to you, my little children, these my last words, love one another unfeignedly, peace. If you keep this course according to the example of the Holy Fathers, God who strengthens the good will help you and I dwelling with him shall intercede for you. He will supply not only enough for the needs of this present life, but also the eternal good things that are prepared as a reward for those who keep the Lord's commandments. So Columbus' final message found in the chapter with numerous quotes and allusions to the life of Antony is a call for peace. It is this message that Columba, or perhaps Adavdan, wished for his, his community to remember above all. And it is the message that is surrounded by allusions and quotes from Antony. So both Adavdan and Athanasius had good reasons to be concerned about division in the body of believers during their respective tenures as church leaders. And both made use of the figure of Antony to promote peace in the community. Now that we have Adamnan's use of Antony fresh in our minds, along with Athanasius' stated goal of promoting peace through the image of Antony, I want to revisit the potential functions of the Paul and Antony panel. It is worth considering a suggestion by art historian Keith Bielenturf that what we see with the Paul and Antony panel may ultimately derive from an image common in the later Roman Empire. The image of the Concordia Augustorum was in use on Roman coins since the second century. The images of these two, emperor, or two emperors, typically standing face to face, was a powerful propagandistic tool used by Roman leaders who sought to emphasize unity and harmony in the empire, even if it didn't exactly accord with reality. 
the emperors would use such images of concord not only to emphasize a present state of affairs, but importantly, they wished to use those images also to project their ideology for the future, one in which they had an expectation of peace. Such images were not restricted solely to emperors. Christians likewise adopted these powerful artistic representations of unity in order to promote peace, especially in times of conflict and strife within the church. To name just one example, the late antique cult of the apostles of Peter and Paul was employed propagandistically during the controversial fourth century pontificate of Pope Damasus, who sought to unite rival factions in Rome and to establish the Roman church as the primary seat of power. He appropriated this imperial image of the Concordia Augusturum for a Christian context. He replaced the emperors facing each other in a sign of unity with the two most important New Testament Christian figures other than Jesus, who are uh, the apostles Peter and Paul. So like the secular images, Pope Damasus used these images of these two holy saints facing each other in a show of unity to project his vision of Christian peace and harmony during times of conflict within the Christian world. Now, I am happy to let the art historians debate whether or not the Irish sculptors of the Paul and Anthony panel ultimately derived their inspiration from the Concordia imagery of late antiquity. That's actually not my primary interest. Um, I'm not an art historian. What I'm interested in is looking at how these images are being used. So even if the Irish artists never saw these types of images, are they being used in a similar manner? Do they have a similar function in their communities? Even if um, the Irish never saw those Roman imagery, the evidence points to a similar intention and a similar function of their use of Paul and Antony, the two founders of monasticism, which would ultimately serve to impart a similar message of concord and unity to the monastic communities. In the case of the Tower Cross at Kells with a strong likelihood of political turbulence during its construction, the message of such an image would certainly be a powerful one. Now the Columba community felt a particularly strong connection to the Egyptian desert fathers, particularly Paul and Antony for centuries. It is evidenced in the art and the literature that they produced. The meaning attached to Paul and Antony derived in part from the Columba community's belief that they were spiritual descendants of these two Egyptian monks. So one of the primary ways that the leaders of the Columban monasteries utilize the figures of Paul and Antony is to promote a vision of peace and concord. The very vision that Adam Nunn tells us Columba had for his community in his dying words. The image of Antony could be used by Adam Nunn to encourage peace when his community was split or at least uh, in some state of distress over the Easter controversy. And the image of this same desert father, along with Paul, could be used by leaders at Kells, perhaps male Bricta, or whoever commissioned the Tower Cross 200 years later to encourage peace and harmony. The case for believing the Paul and Antony scene also had the intended function on the Tower Cross of Kells of projecting an ideology of peace is strengthened by a rather mysterious panel at the top of the Tower Cross at Kells, where two seated figures posed and positioned so that neither is seen as being superior over the other, sit side by side. The figure on the left holds a book in his hands, while the figure on the right holds what seems to be either a book or a panel. Now, Peter Harvison points out that in certain lighting, he calls it oblique lighting, there seems to be a ringed cross visible on that object in light relief. This ringed cross held by the figure on the right seems to indicate that these two figures are not biblical. In light of this dedication of the cross to Saints Columba and Patrick, I am inclined to agree with Peter Harbison that these two figures most likely represent Columba and Patrick. And if this is correct, and I believe there is good reason to believe that it is, that this would make this panel the earliest extant representation of these two saints. It is very rare to, on Irish high crosses to represent Irish figures before the 12th century. But on a cross dedicated to these two saints, such a panel representing these two saints would make perfect sense, especially if one message that the commissioner of the cross wanted to impart was unity, as both monastic leaders are sitting side by side harmoniously, though, and being positioned uh, just above the Paul and Anthony panel on the cross, the message of unity and concord would certainly not be lost on the monastic audience. 
Now, in conclusion, I think it's worth pointing out that the two scenes on the either side of the transom of the east face of the tower cross, where we have Abraham sacrificing Isaac on the left and Paul and Antony on the right, we have the three figures on this face to which the author of the Betha Colum Kill explicitly compares both Columba and all the faithful who follow in their footsteps. What we see on either side of the cross face are the spiritual fathers of the Columban monks. If I'm correct that the top panel shows Patrick and Columba, then we have a complete spiritual lineage represented on this cross. From Abraham, the original religious exile and the father of the faithful, to Paul and Antony, who are the originators of the monastic life, through to Columba, who is the founder of the Irish branch of Abraham's family, Paul and Antony's family as well, to which the community belongs. We are seeing a sort of spiritual family tree represented here on this cross, which is a powerful message for the monastic community. It's rooting their identity in a spiritual lineage. I want to conclude with this with the man who is most responsible for Columba's legacy, which is out of non, because he is the one who actually first makes the connection between Columba and Abraham. It was not the author of the Betha Colum Kill. In the second preface of the life of Columba, he calls Columba a Phillies Reprimissionis, which translates as a son of promise. Now, this is a quote taken from the Vulgate from Galatians 4.28, which I've copied at the top of this slide where the Apostle Paul is affirming that the Gentiles in the church of Galatia are a part of Abraham's spiritual family. The Apostle Paul says, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. This is a family bound by belief and not by blood, in which Christians have been adopted according to the book of Galatians. And this language of family is one that permeates the literature of the Columban Familia. And it's an image that we see on this cross right here with Abraham and Isaac uh, on the left and Paul and Antony on the right. With as much time, cost, and effort that went into constructing these magnificent crosses, it cannot possibly be lost on the community that their spiritual father Columba was called a child of promise, like Abraham's son Isaac, who is represented here on this cross. With Abraham in one of the most pivotal scenes in the Old Testament, they would recall as the author of the Betha Colum Kill emphasizes that they too are also a Phileus Reprimissionis, a son of promise, if they too follow in the footsteps of Abraham, Paul, and Antony, like their founder Columba did before them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Meredith. Uh, for a wonderfully stimulating and uh, visually rich uh, presentation. You've brought us from the, the sands of Egypt uh, to uh, the wilds of Scotland and uh, back to uh, the pastures of, of County Meath uh, with wonderful Kells Cross. So thank you very, very much. Um, if you could just stop sharing your screen at the moment. And yeah, perfect. Now, um, yeah, just some comments on on what a fantastic uh, presentation uh, that was. So um, thank you very much. We're, we're just gonna we we, we have a few few uh, minutes just to open up for Q and A. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A uh, for me, and and uh, I'll field them to uh, to Meredith. Um, so just uh, thanks coming in again for for the presentation. Um, Okay. Yeah, from uh, uh, yeah, from Kieran uh, McGill in in France. Uh, great talk, thank you. Snakes and poison image for heresy and schism, uh, tie in with Saint Patrick, uh, the image legend of him riding Ireland, riding Ireland. The Ireland snakes. But yeah, that that was my first thought too. And I actually had to reread the scene because my first thought was that. Um, he that Columbo rid the snakes, but actually he didn't rid the snakes. He just rendered them harmless, which I thought was interesting. So, and that's much. That's a much later tradition, isn't it? It's that's right. Twelfth century. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, this is from Bernice. Um, yeah. So, in in terms of this later tradition, do you think that could be an image for Saint Patrick in terms of promoting harmony 
as well that kind of image it's a very it's a very common motif isn't it kind of driving out snakes it is and and um the reason why i didn't go into gregory the great's um dialogues is because it's quite a complicated uh story that um adamnon's drawing from uh, but the the story that gregory the great actually has in the dialogues that adamnon is kind of styling this scene after is also about monastic harmony because you have two communities that are um kind of at odds with each other and strife ensues and uh, as a result, snakes end up getting banished uh, and killed, actually. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of a complicated story, but um, the, the motif of the snakes being banished and killed by holy figures is almost, as far as I can tell, is always tied to um, ridding of schism and heresy. So. Yeah, and you, you make that wonderful connection with, with venena and, and, and poison. Um, so this is from Timothy Jones. Um, yeah, if the cross is a family tree of Abraham, what are the other pictures on the cross representing? And how did St. Anthony make the monastic life popular? Yeah, so with St. Anthony making the monastic life popular, um, first of all, it has to do partly with the skill of his hagiographer. So Athanasius was a brilliant writer. And um, he basically, I mean, it really came down to Athanasius, I think, and, and more than anything. Um, it also helped that uh, almost immediately after Athanasius wrote his uh, piece, Evagrius translated into Latin, which widely disseminated it throughout Europe. Um, but also Antony's a likable figure. He was, he was not the first, and Athanasius you know, mentions that Antony trained with other monks, but as Jerome even admits, Antony's the one that made it popular. Um, you know, he's not, he's not as harsh as some of them. You know, he does have, even though he himself was quite ascetic, he, uh, you know, was a little bit more moderate than some of the other Egyptian desert fathers. So he wasn't, um, you know, totally unapproachable. He, even though he wanted to be a hermit, he always made time to have this pastoral side to him. So he was a, kind of an approachable ascetic as well. So I think there are several different factors to why he's so popular, but I think the ultimate reason is because of Athanasius's skill. Mm. Yeah. Um... And about the uh, cross and the uh, family. So the other picture, so, these, um, with when it comes to looking at the iconographical, you know, the cycles on these high crosses, it's not always clear what the, you know, what the intentions are. So when we look at, um, for instance, we'll take the example of uh, at Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So these images are almost never meant to be read just as one level. So Abraham sacrificing Isaac is a literal representation of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, but the Irish also attached a uh, a Christological meaning to it. So they saw it as a prefigurement or a foreshadowing of Jesus being sacrificed because Isaac was, of course, uh, innocent. Um, so they, they saw it as kind of a prefigurement of Jesus being sacrificed. And so there's multiple levels of the way these images are interpreted. And so, uh, for instance, um, when I was saying that there's a spiritual family tree here, I don't think that that's necessarily the main thing that they, the artists were trying to convey uh, with this. I think that, that just, that's just a side thing. Um, I think the main, uh, some of the main themes that you see uh, in the circle, at least the, the iconography around the circle, is, uh, litur is um, Eucharistic. So you see, you know, like a, a theme of communion, you see a sacrifice, you see um, that, so. And we, we have an interesting question from Matthew Anderson, where he's talking about um, the, the links between the three panels of the cross. So in addition to the child of pro promise or family of Abraham links, um, could there be a link made between locations? So Mount Moriah, the Egyptian desert, the monastic life in Ireland, and this kind of uh, representation of holy land or a land made holy by sacrifice. That is a great question. Yeah. <laughs> that's a big one too. Um, yeah, so it, it is a quick question for you. It's actually would be, it, it, the answer is yes, there is um, a real tie between topography and, um, you know, kind of holiness. So like, for instance, you see in Irish hagiography, mountains um, are often places that holy things happen, like St. Brendan goes to a mountain before he goes on his Paragonatio, for instance. Um, Thomas O'Loughlin has a really great article uh, called The Topography of Holiness that I would recommend that uh, kind of goes into this into some detail. Uh, actually goes into quite more detail than I can give in a quick answer. Uh, but yeah, so a kind of representation of Holy Land, yes. Um, yes, the, the, the idea of Ireland being kind of this sacred soil is for sure there. 
um, because you see this, for instance, in the way even the monasteries are constructed. I think of the life of Columbanus, for instance, where you have, um, you know, kind of different layers or different um, kind of concentric circles that are represented different levels of holiness. So like the inner circle is the most holy and a Columbanus, as Alex can tell you, I got into some mischief with uh, the Merovingian court because he wouldn't allow people that weren't part of the community into this kind of inner sanctum. So yes, there was this idea of holy ground, um, very much so. And you see this in the life of Columba as well. Uh, if you notice that when the man who had committed um, who had, who had done some kin slaying and had fornicated with his mother, um, he was not even allowed to set foot on Iona. And Thomas Charles Edwards insightfully points out it's because his very presence would have been polluting to the island of Iona. So Columba didn't even let his boat land. And so, yeah, there is a real connection there um, with the soil. Mm. So. Yeah, just uh, I'll, I'll answer this question from Moira Foley. Um, it's it's um, might Patrick also be considered an exile devoting his mission to Ireland? Uh, yes, definitely. I, I would say, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's that's certainly the case. And uh, from Annalise Perez, um, how are these crosses preserved? It seems like over so much time they'd been really worn down, and we couldn't be able to distinguish the, the different characters. Yeah, I mean that's a great question, Annalise, because if you notice on the high crosses, some of them are so worn you can't even see them. So for instance, the Abraham sacrificing Isaac, it would be very hard to see it um, unless you had others to compare it to and you'd be like, okay, this is what I'm looking at. So if it were in isolation, the one on the Kells cross is because um, a lot of them are made like of sandstone or stone that's um, real porous, so it absorbs water and it, it just over time. So um, there are preservation, uh, there are preservation uh, programs going on. So like they'll move high crosses sometimes and put, at least in the case of Iona, for instance, they put up a replica cross or they'll put, you know, glass around the cross in their original location. So there are, they are aware of it, um, but it does take time. But, you know, whenever you move a cross, it's actually kind of sad in a sense, just because you're taking it away from its original location. Um, but at the same time, obviously preserving that is extremely important. So. Yeah, I think the National Museum in, in Ireland has done some work in that in terms of kind of laser. Yeah, they've been doing the 3D scanning, haven't they? Yeah. 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 Um, and just a final question uh, from Bernice. Um, do you know if the patrician and Columban monastic federations remained united after Mail Uh No, no, um, they did not. Um, because that actually the, those quotes that I gave about the patrician family griping about Columban encroachment actually came after Mail Brichta's tenure, about 200 years. Um, but what's interesting, if you look at the Annals of Ulster, um, there are two other examples later on, about 100 years and then 200 years after Mail Brichta, where you see another dual Kamarba ship. So you see where um, you see a, a someone who is a Kamarba or an heir, a successor of Columba and P Patrick at the same time. So he was the first, but he was not the only. Um, so I'm not sure how much rivalry is there. I mean, there seems to have been, you know, enough that the literature kind of bears it out, but it doesn't seem to have been consistent through time. So it seems like it was kind of a, an up and down type of relationship. So. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, I'll just finish with this uh, uh, <laughs> re representative uh, from just what we're getting uh, from Dennis Jordan uh, for you, Meredith. Thank you for a most wonderful presentation. I will never pass a high cross without thinking of this talk and looking more carefully, Dennis. So well, that's, that's then my, then my job has been. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, that, I'm good then. That's a great note to, to conclude <laughs> with. Um, so just um, thank, thank you, uh, first of all, Meredith, and thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, the next lecture in this series will be on the 29th of September uh, at the same time. And you can register for the webinar on the Loyola uh, Institute website or on columnkilla.net uh, in, the, in the events section. And you need to register for, for each lecture uh, in the series. The next lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Foncha Ryan and Dr. Cornelius Casey uh, from the Loyola Institute at Trinity College Dublin on Suscala uh, More Columnkilla, the great gospel of Columnkilla, which will look uh, at uh, in more depth uh, the kind of theology um, of the Book of Kells. So that promises to be a, a fascinating uh, lecture as well. And particularly the theology of the Book of Kells is often uh, neglected. Uh, so we look forward to that. So I hope you can join us again for our fourth uh, lecture in the series. 
in the meantime, uh, Sloan August Bannock.